Since 2011, Steve Howard has been IKEA Group's Chief Sustainability Officer. He believes that sustainability will be one of the mega trends that shape society and the business landscape this century. He is committed to developing innovative ways to make sustainability attractive and affordable for everyone. Steve was the founder and CEO of The Climate Group, an independent nonprofit organization working internationally with government and business leaders to cut global emissions and build a low carbon economy. Describing himself as a professional optimist, Steve is a leading authority on sustainability and climate change and believes politicians and business leaders must tackle urgent environmental and economic challenges together to create new jobs and build a prosperous and clean economy. Ladies and gentlemen, Steve Howard. It's quite disturbing to see your face that big, actually. Um, it's uh, an honor to be here this afternoon, and uh, an honor to share the jury, really, uh, and a responsibility as well. Uh, you have to put up with me for a few minutes before you find out the stuff you really want to know, which is uh, who's won today. Uh, I'm just going to share some personal reflections. I'll touch a little bit on uh, what, have, what uh, we've been doing at IKEA, but also some trends in the world around us. Um, First, I'd just like to actually go back. When uh, Jim and I uh, started the climate group uh, 11, 12, 12 years back, um, we were looking for funders that would take a leap of faith. Uh, it's being a social entrepreneur or a business entrepreneur is very, very similar. And actually, Dune Foundation uh, was uh, one of the very first funders to support us, a long-term funder of the, the climate group. So uh, it's actually uh, special for me to be here because Without Doing Foundation and one or two others, the climate group wouldn't have succeeded. So thank you very much for that. Um, I'm going to give you three numbers and three rules. I may deviate from this. I have no notes. But three numbers and three rules um, and a couple of anecdotes along the way. Okay. Uh, the, f the first anecdote actually comes if you go back to uh, when my grandmother was born, 1901 Manchester, uh, there was a, a crisis meeting of the world cities at that point of time because of the environmental problem of the day. And the environmental problem of the day was horse manure on city streets. The city streets of Amsterdam, of New York, of London were literally piling high with horse manure. And uh, there was a projection that said by, by 1950, the streets of London would be 10 feet deep in horse manure three meters deep, uh, and people were really alarmed about this. And uh, the horse industry did not come up with a plan, actually. It's a, there's some lessons from history on this. Um, the, it, but it was actually people solved. It, were, it was the trams. It was the automakers. It was the, the bicycle makers. It was the buses that solved it. And actually, over the following 20, 25 years, uh, the horse manure pretty much disappeared from the streets, an incredible pace of change. So this is to say we've seen this movie before. I'm going to run through the sort of uh, the, th the stuff we know well, but I, I frame sustainability for my colleagues at, at IKEA with, with three numbers. And they're quite daunting, but you think uh, we have had challenges in the past, and what uh, people do best is come together around great challenges. So uh, there's a, these numbers are easy to remember. The first number is one and a half. Probably most people know hit this here, uh, but there's Currently, we're using the resources of one and a half planets every year. The, the fisheries that we overconsume, the excess CO2 we put in the atmosphere, uh, the water that we extract from, that we really mine that's thousands of years old and overexploit, uh, the farmland that we, that we slowly actually destroy the soil, really one and a half planets. We all know how many planets we have. Um, and uh, the cautious business as usual projection is we get to two, two and a half planets uh, sometime in the next 20, 30 years or so. Um, and that's definitely more planets than we have. Uh, and uh, people talked about the financial deficit uh, from, and the fiscal deficit uh, and the economy. Well, actually being in planetary deficit is actually more serious. And we've been kind of in planetary deficit since about 1980. And we're 
beginning to really feel the consequences of it today. So we have to, we have to change course radically on that. It is not the time for incrementalism. It's the time for transformational change and big ideas. Um, the second number, so first one's one and a half, the next one's three. And this is a good number, mostly a good number. It has challenges with it, but it's a good number. Uh, the world today is majority poor, so most people live, live with very limited means below the poverty lines. Many people go to bed having only had you know, one or two meals in the day. Um, uh, but people are coming out of poverty like never before. So by about 2030, three billion extra people are lifted out of poverty in the emerging markets around the world. Maybe a little faster or a little slower. But what that basically says is today's global economy, um, those one and a half planets a year, is mostly geared towards the two, two and a half billion people above the poverty line. The people that drive the cars, fly in the planes, uh, drink the milk, wear the cotton. Um, and, uh, you know, we're going to dramatically expand that number in 15 short years. Uh, never in human history have we seen uh, the economy expand like that. And um, the good news is for people and their families coming out of poverty, and you'd have to say, this is, needs to be part of the great endeavor of this century is to end poverty. Um, and I think you can see, even in Africa now, a lot of sub-Saharan Africa, which I, I lived in Kenya for a couple of years, um, and I thought that Africa was lost for another century, but now you can see people coming out of, out of poverty there, new businesses developing, uh, actually really, really looks like uh, mo many countries are actually on a really good economic development path. So that's great. But then you think, three billion extra consumers in the world, we have to do things differently. One and a half, three. The next number is six. I have more numbers in this sequence, but I'm only going to do three today. Um, six is six degrees warming. So uh, this is a special year on climate change, actually. Uh, we all know that we've got Paris coming up, where the world's governments will come. And I think, actually, they'll come up with a pretty decent agreement. It won't be everything we need, but it will be enough to actually drive um, further progress, we'll really see a, a wave of innovation in this low-carbon world as we start to get stronger and stronger government policy. Let's keep our fingers crossed on that and do what we can to push that over the line. Uh, but the, the six number comes from, uh, this is actually, if you look at beyond this century, it takes uh, a couple of hundred years to come through, that uh, we're on path towards six degrees warming. Now, the world was just 14 degrees on average. A lot colder at the poles, a lot hotter at the equator, and um, we've warmed it by about one degree. If we had set out to do that, if we'd set ourselves a target, we'd be very proud of ourselves, warming the entire world by one degree. Yeah. Uh, an amazing thing. Most of that's happened really in the last 30 years or so as well. We now put a billion tons of CO2 into the atmosphere every week. And we know the carbon budget that we have. You can basically do the graph. A quarter of that carbon lasts 500 years. Yeah. So if we, the, the billion tons we put up this week, yeah. 250 million tons of that is still causing global warming in 500 years' time. So we, we know how fast we have to act. And based, by about 2060 or so, we have to be net zero. Um, we have to have effectively zero carbon emissions. This totally transforms every sector of society. From an innovation point of view, it's hugely exciting, but it's also really daunting, because it means emissions have to peak by 2020 and then decline rapidly. And currently today, we're on, on track for six degrees of warming. It's a radically, radically different world that we can't allow to happen. And uh, the chief economist at the International Energy Agency, he said, basically, sooner or later, if you keep on the path you're on, you get where you're heading. Right? Now, I'm, I'm a business guy. Now, and you know, I like plans and I like to know if I'm on this path and I keep long enough, I'll get to the end of the path. The path today is a six degree path. So it means we have to change direction and not just a little bit. It's a radical change of direction. And that's why um, something like the Green Challenge is so important, really, because it's about uh, capturing people's imagination but also bringing a sharp focus onto this challenge which people describe as an existential 
challenge. First time I heard the word existential, I thought it was uh, you know, some abstract uh, philosophical term. And then he realized when you think about it, no, it's about a challenge to our existence. Uh, there's not many existential challenges that we face. And this one's entirely of our own making, uh, really. Now, uh, I'm an optimist. That's why I told the horse manure story first. You know, if you were really, really, really worried about horse manure in 19, 1900 and you hung around for 25 years, you saw the problem go away. I believe this is a solvable problem for us. So I'll give you my, my three rules. Uh, now, uh, the first one, it's been a, a learning probably over a long time for me, uh, but it's go all in. Uh, or I, sometimes I talk about the power of 100%. And uh, there's actually... A, good friend of mine in, in HSBC, the bank who uh, several years ago took them carbon neutral. And he said he could have gone into the board and said, um, we can go for a 2% reduction on energy a year for the next 25 years. And the board would have said, fine, fine, next. And he said, we're going to go carbon neutral uh, instead. Um, so it was a more, but it, there's something about actually going all in. Uh, I'll give you an example from, from some of the things that, that uh, we've done. Um, if you have targets, this is in businesses, in organizations, in governments. I have said this, and I've seen heads of state write it down, actually. I don't see, know if how many have acted on it yet. Uh, I'll, keep, I'll keep count on that. Um, but uh, if you say have a target for 90%, whatever it is, lots of people find a reason to be in the 10%. If you set a target for 50%, you are 50% confused. We are going to totally change things by 50%. That means you're going to totally keep the th things the same for the other 50%, uh, you, it creates confusion. If you can go for 100%, it creates tremendous clarity. And that's why you can see with the entrepreneurs that we have today, um, uh, actually, they're, they're going all in with the ideas they have to, to disrupt industries. Um, we did this about four years ago in IKEA. Uh, we sell a lot of lights, a lot of lights in IKEA. And uh, I think that a part of the inspiration came from this, from again, from, came from something that uh, the lottery did here with, with LED bulbs, giving two million bulbs away um, six, seven years ago, I think it was. And uh, I had our lighting council, we had a, a, a meeting with the lighting council, and I just said, thinking I might be fired for it actually, I said, why don't we just ban the halogens and ban the CFLs? How fast can we do that? And then the team came back about two months later and they said, this is the pre-study. We can ban them by the 1st of September 2015. We can be only sell LED bulbs in our stores then. We think we can get to the right price point uh, at that point in time and totally take away all of the others. And uh, uh, then we took a couple of steps. We made the decision to do that. But then we got the whole business purpose behind that. So straight away, we, we didn't make an investment uh, that we would have made in slightly better compact fluorescent bulbs. We put all of the money behind the LEDs. We totally went back up the supply chain and figured out how could you improve quality and improve the price of everything. We agreed to have margins, the, the, the profit, incredibly low at every point in the business uh, so you could get to the right price faster. We said, let's, let's actually just put some big orders back up the supply chain to get to scale. And about 18 months ago, we saw the market start to respond. People got the, the value proposition. Uh, on, on these bulbs. They are the next best thing to daylight uh, LEDs. Um, really, you've got something that will last 25 years or so. Um, if we put them end to end in their use, we, we, we sold about a billion years of light this last year and uh, uh, with the LEDs. Now, it's one company, it's one thing that you can do, but that's four years to go from being a business sell selling halogens and CFLs to a business only selling LEDs in stores around the world. The other thing we picked on was to go 100% for renewable energy. And uh, we thought renewable energy is better. And it, it's interesting, people talked about it as alternative energy. Uh, if you were a visitor from space, I don't know if we've got anyone from space here today, or thinks that may think they are, but uh, uh, you can talk to me afterwards. Uh, but people, if you were a visitor from space, you came down and you saw actually people going to drill in the Arctic to take fossilized dinosaur food out from under the Earth's crust and to burn it, causing uh, planetary-changing pollution. 
uh, with huge financial risk and devastating environmental, social, and economic consequences. And that's mainstream energy. And then you saw a wind farm spinning or a solar panel generating dependable, clean energy. Uh, where once it's installed, your cost of energy production is free. Yeah. Then which would look like mainstream energy? Where would you say the risk was? Where's the common sense? Where's the smart money? So we said, we'll put our money behind uh, renewable energy and common sense energy. We'll put it behind. So now we've got uh, 23 wind farms spinning in nine countries. and. Soon we'll have installed our one million solar panel. I was telling uh, uh, the ambassador from the US just earlier uh, that in, in the US, actually, we've got the largest rooftop solar installations in 10 US states on IKEA stores and distribution centers. Um, and uh, when our CFO, our new fa chief financial officer, turned up three years ago, after about uh, a week, he just said, um, I thought you owned the, uh, the wind farms. And I said, no, you own the Malister. You own them. And he was like, oh, I, I own these wind farms. And obviously, I'm on behalf of the company. But, uh, and then uh, uh, we looked into it. And these give a really good return. This is a good financial investment. But it's also fantastic for the business. We completely eliminate our, uh, the greenhouse gas emissions directly associated with our own factories, our distribution centers, and our stores. And we're, uh, we set a target for 70% this year. Don't worry, it is 100% for 2020. And we'll be, we'll be over that 70% for this year. Uh, and we're right on track to get ahead of schedule to our 100% target. Um, so there's something about the power of going all in. Anybody setting targets anywhere, set yourself the boldest one. The first time I said this publicly, I, I then went back to my team and said, we've got some targets that aren't 100%. Let's really look at those. And I think we've pretty much eliminated all of them now. Um, so the, the, the go all in. The next target is make things better. And I think you know, you've got people today trying to bring better solutions uh, forwards. And I, I, don't, I think I've was uh, been involved in the environment movement a long time. And early on, the environment movement was kind of about creating grip guilt. You know, it was um, you know, be guilty for the fashion, be guilty for the milk, be guilty for your water bottle, uh, be guilty for going on holiday. You really, really want to go on holiday. Uh, you'd love to get on a plane, be really guilty about it. Be guilty if you drive your car. And um, the, uh, it's, we have always aspired to better. It's about making better, smarter choices. So it is about choosing renewable energy versus uh, polluting energy. It is about choosing uh, LED lights that will last 20, 25 years with a tiny amount of energy use rather than old-fashioned heaters come light bulbs. It's about choosing, choosing electric vehicles uh, rather than the conventional vehicles. And these choices are increasingly available for us now. So I think we have to be inspired by the future. We are going to facilitate people around the world to have better choices. And simple things that are coming, if you look at, we're in the sort of distribution phase of the internet now the sort of emerging shared economy, Airbnb and Uber and technologies like this. Of course, they create some, some uh, pain as they disrupt uh, sectors. But generally, actually, they make it very easy and convenient and actually also start to dematerialize things. They've converted unused bedrooms into hotel beds uh, or sometimes underutilized uh, cars into uh, highly utilized taxis. So better choices going forwards. And uh, let's uh, be inspired as we look towards this century of saying, actually, stuff's just going to get cooler as we go forwards. Um, my, my last rule is uh, about not waiting for permission and don't wait to be asked. Really don't wait to be asked. And uh, I'm thinking, especially I know there's a lot of uh, a lot of people a year or two younger than me in the audience. Um, and I, when I was a student, I, went to, I was a volunteer for some time in Mauritius. And uh, there's an inspiring guy called Carl Jones who'd gone out there. He'd actually was sent out there. It was a conservation project. He was sent down to close it down. And there's these fantastic birds on Mauritius called the Mauritian Kestrel. 
Uh, Mauritius is a special place. It's the first is the island where we realized we could make stuff extinct. The expression is dead as a dodo. That comes from Mauritius, because we realized that was really dead. You know, when the, when the dodo was gone, it, there was no bringing it back except as a stuffed version. Now, the Mauritian kestrel was going kind of the same way, and there were really just uh, a few eggs left. And Carl, instead of letting, closing down the project and letting the bird become extinct, he took those eggs into captive breeding. And now there's hundreds and hundreds of Mauritian kestrels uh, 25 years later. And Carl said to me, uh, when I, I was thinking, you know, how do you find these opportunities? He, said, he pretty much said, it wasn't the, exactly his words, but don't wait to be asked. You know, there are so many challenges and opportunities out there um, uh, for people to work on. But if you choose to find them, if you work to find them, and you go and make them happen, you'll be surprised about what you can do. And I remember that when, uh, when as I said, when Jim and I, uh, with a, a borrowed laptop computer on our own credit cards, uh, set out to have a, establish a, an international organization uh, 12 years ago. Um, and then a, a, a closing thought, really. If, if we think of this century, and if, if the news is so bad, I, I know I have seen a couple of uh, positive news channels opened up where they only show good news. Um, but even I lost interest, actually. You sort of seem to, we're, addu uh, we're addicted to the sort of negative news cycle, and there's a lot of challenges out there. But I, I look back at the last century. So, as I mentioned, my grandmother born 1901. Um, there was no vote for women in Western Europe or much of the world at that point in time. Um, she lived in a house that didn't have electricity, that had um, no running hot water. Uh, it was impossible for her to have even come to the Netherlands, really, without a, an extraordinary effort from Manchester. Um, information was still in books and newspapers. Information flow was in the hands of the few and very slow. And you think of that century of extraordinary progress. And for most people, it's ended up with more opportunity, with a fairer world, a much more interesting world, with much more opportunity at the end of that century than at the beginning. And, and now, as Gore Vidal says, history comes with a fast-forward button. Um, and it's going to just get faster. So we've got more human potential today uh, in terms of smart, motivated, educated people who want to affect change. This is going to be an extraordinary century. And in my intro, uh, which apart from the very large Steve head, I liked very much, but in the intro where it described me as uh, uh, an optimist, uh, my son, when he was 10 years old, he said, um, he said, Daddy, you're a possibilist. You're not an optimist, because an optimist believes in good things happening despite the evidence. And uh, a pessimist believes in bad things happening despite the evidence. Whereas a, a possibilist, let's all be possibilists, you look at what are the possible futures, and then you say, that, that future, that possible future is the one I really like. So if we work to be the people and the generations that say, we will have a world where there are more trees uh, the, the, when we're gone than when we started, where the fisheries come back, where you have clean rivers running through cities and blue skies, where we end global warming, where we have universal equality, universal education, and we end poverty, then we can make it happen. And I think this is a, a great event to inspire that sort of change. So thank you very much. Thank you.